Welcome everyone to Homelands and to our online service for this week. Before we go um, any further today, must say a huge thanks to Doreen, Dick, um, Carol and Colleen for their input into last week's 4x4 service. It was, again, um, exceptionally well received and thanks to all who um, put so much time and effort into bringing their thoughts. Um, this week we're continuing, we're continuing our journey in Mark and remaining in Mark chapter 10. We'll come to that um, again in a minute, but I also want to say thanks to those who came to pray and to discuss on Thursday last week regarding the future direction of the ministry at Homelands. It was a very open and useful and positive um, discussion and prayer time. And um, shortly over the next um, couple of weeks, um, we'll be digesting the results of what we talked about and a letter and email will be coming out summarising um, the next steps and um, talking about the decisions that were made and where we feel we're being called by God to go from here. So exciting times and do look out for that and do continue to pray and discuss as we discern together um, the call on our lives as God's church in this place at this time, a missional community for and of the people of Homelands. In a moment for today, Carol is going to lead our prayers, um, but before that, we're going to have our first piece of sung worship, led um, splendidly as always by our singers and musicians. So let's sing in worship. based on Psalm 148 and on the hymn Hallelujah Praise Jehovah. I'll read part of the hymn and then pray around it. So let's pray together. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise, proclaim. All the hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O you heaven of heavens, and you floods above the sky. Let them praises bring Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Lord, we praise you that you are such an almighty God, that you are the highest, that you are in heaven, 
and we marvel that the angels even now are proclaiming your praise and we join our praise with them you are such an amazing god even the sun the moon and the stars are praising you as the sun shines and the moon reflects and as the stars twinkle in the sky they're reflecting your glory and praising your holy name and we join in praising you with them even the floods above the sky the rain clouds the storms the lightning the thunder they all praise you father we join together today to praise your holy name let them praises give jehovah they were made at his command then forever he established his decree shall ever stand from the earth i praise jehovah all you seas, you monsters all, fire and hail and snow and vapours, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Lord, as we consider the sea and all the fish that live in it, the whales, the sharks, all praising you, as they continue on their mysterious journeys through the deeps. Father, the, the weather, the snow, the, the ice, the hail, they're all praising you. Even the hurricanes have to obey your commands. Oh Lord, you are so majestic and we praise you with them today. And Lord, we think of the mountains and hills. When we go on holiday, we see such amazing sights. And Lord, the mountains are full of your glory and we praise you with them. Nor we praise you as at this time of harvest, as we look in the orchards and as we see the crops being gathered um, and we see the trees as they shed their leaves this autumn. And in doing so, they are praising you. And Lord, we want today to add our praises with them. We praise you because you are such an amazing God. All you fruitful trees and cedars, hills and mountains high, creeping things, beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all you people, princes great, earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Lord, it's just amazing to be able to praise you with all the peoples on this earth. Lord, on this Sunday, we know that people are praising you from every continent on this planet, and we join our praises with them. Lord, there are great people praising you, and there are the poorest people praising you. There are important people praising you. Kings praise you, judges praise you. Also though, even little children can praise you. And Lord, today we add our praises with them. Lord, we praise you because you are God and you are worthy of our praise. And we bring you our prayers now in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord, alleluia, amen. Well, thank you, Carol, for leading us in prayer and to everyone involved in our service this week. As I said before, we are continuing our journey in Mark's Gospel and we've looked at various passages through the lens of questions and of statements. We began a few weeks ago in Mark chapter 8 with the question um, from Jesus to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And this is such an important question, as you recall, the nature of our understanding of God is so fundamental to the way we are and the way we behave our discipleship journey as Christians. What is important to us is consciously or subconsciously driven by what we understand about God. If God is a God of mission, then we want to be missional. We want to be focused on those outside. If we see God primarily as um, the object of our worship, then we might focus more on the internal stuff, on coming together and worshipping individually and corporately. And we've kind of teased out some of those questions. And 
even in our discussions um, this week and ongoing about the future, these things return. So it's a really important question. Who do you say that I am? Mark Nye brought us the question, who is the greatest? Where are our priorities? Who is important? What is important? And we're going to return to that theme later on because it comes up again in this part of Mark chapter 10. A couple of um, sessions ago we moved into Mark chapter 10 and we found Jesus rebuking his disciples as they turned away children who wanted to come to see him and be blessed. And we thought about that, thinking about the importance of a whole family of God, but also that the gospel is for all, that Jesus rejects nobody who comes to seek him. And we shouldn't be the gatekeepers. We shouldn't be the ones who fence and say this um, sector, this part of society, this group of people, however we think about them, and beyond the love of God. And it's really important to continually remind ourselves that the gospel is for all. And last week, as we've mentioned, we had our um, four by four, four friends reflecting on the nature of what it means to enter the kingdom of God. The question is, what must I do? What must I do to be caught up in the story of Jesus? What must I do to enter the kingdom? So this time we're going on just a little further in Mark um, chapter 10 to verses 35 and onwards. And Jesus throughout um, these last three chapters has been on the move. There's a, a physical journey as well as a spiritual journey going on. And there's been a lot of information, a lot of discussion, a bit like our kind of thoughts about the future, but on a much larger scale. And the disciples are probably constantly saying to themselves, what does this mean? What is going on? And they're trying to process and trying to kind of shake down what it means for them. What is Jesus actually saying? And so we have this narrative, this story um, in Mark 10 um, from verse 35. And Keith is going to remind us of what it is by reading it to us. So thank you, Keith. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Jesus teaches about serving others. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favour. What is your request? he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honour next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptised with the baptism of suffering I must be baptised with? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptised with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A huge thanks to Keith for reading that to us today. And the main characters in this narrative, in this section of the story, apart from Jesus, are the brothers James and John. Elsewhere in his gospel, Mark calls James and John the sons of thunder, the sons of thunder. A great name, maybe. <laughs> Depends what you think about thunder. James and John, J and J, was with their father was Zebedee, and some have speculated that Salome, one of the women who brought spices to anoint Jesus' body in the tomb, was their mother. 
But there's no suggestion that their thunderous reputation comes from their parentage. Perhaps more likely it was from their character. Luke records that James and John were with Jesus when they came to a village in Samaria and the reception that the disciples received from this village was less than hospitable. And James and John kind of say to Jesus, oh, this is ridiculous. This is an outrage. Shall we call down fire upon heaven on this village? Shall we wipe out this village with calling on divine wrath because they have refused to treat us well? Quite a kind of dramatic approach. Perhaps that was their way. They were kind of always quick to rise with a kind of visceral um, physical response to things that were going on around them. So perhaps they're thund sons of thunder for that reason. Perhaps it's some other reason that we don't know. Because James and John do seem to be with Peter in some form of kind of inner circle, or at least often when Jesus is with a very small group of disciples, he seems to be with Peter and James and John. And we can think of a number of um, occasions in Scripture when Peter and James and John are together, um, apparently alone, with Jesus. So perhaps for that reason, they see that something is building the journey to Jerusalem, the physical and spiritual journey to Jerusalem, is growing in momentum. And there's an opportunity to get in early, to get in on the bottom step, the bottom rung of the ladder, and they call shotgun. You know, shotgun, the rule that when you're in sight of the vehicle, if you can't say shotgun, you get to sit in the front seat. If you say shotgun before anybody else, when you can see the vehicle, you get to sit and ride shotgun, ride alongside the driver in the front. And so they say, oh, Jesus, when we get to heaven, I don't think anybody else has asked you this yet, so maybe we're the first to ask, we can get in early. Can we be the ones who sit on your left and on your right, kind of be up there with you, just one step below you? And Jesus hears them, and perhaps he knows the question is coming. And he kind of says, well, you know, he's stringing them along, but perhaps seriously says, well, if, if you want to, but can you do the things that I'm going to do, really, boys? Do you know the road of bitterness and suffering that I'm going to go through? If you can do that, then maybe we'll consider it. Perhaps he's being serious. Perhaps he's just kind of playing them along because he knows their character. And James and John, the J and J boys, the Thunder boys say, yes, we can do it. We can do it. We are able. We are able. Come on, Jesus, set us a challenge. We can meet it. And Jesus responds again, perhaps more directly that this is a journey to the cross. We know in Mark 8 he's talked about the journey to the cross and it's a journey but not in the way that James and John think yes says Jesus. There are places on the right and on the left but they're not his to give. They're not his to give and that's an interesting theological question isn't it friends? Then if it's not Jesus's choice then who is it? Who does have the say? Something to ponder. For me, it could well be that it's the whole nature of God. Jesus, as one person of the Godhead, is only part of the mystery of the Trinity. And it's the whole nature of God in time and eternity that would be involved in these kind of things, even if these kind of things are really a question at all. Jesus, the human Jesus was confined to a single time and a single place. And there's no need for James and John to kind of panic by to get in because they happen to have the privilege of walking alongside the human Jesus. And of course, eventually, the other 10 disciples find out what James and John have been up to, that they've kind of made this call or tried to make this call. And the other 10 as you can imagine, are furious. They are indignant in the words of this translation. Now, maybe some of them are frustrated because they hadn't 
had asked first. They hadn't had the audacity of the Thunder Brothers to kind of go up and be so bold. Perhaps it was just typical of James and John's behaviour. But whatever it is, Jesus kind of has to come back and explain once again what kingdom is all about. That it's not about status. It's not about priority or rank order. The kingdom of God, the kingdom that he's bringing in, announcing its presence and its future reality, this kingdom is not a normal kingdom. It's a kingdom where leaders must be servants and that those who would be first must be the slaves of all. The kingdom it is, the kingdom is and the kingdom will be a topsy-turvy, inside out, back to front kingdom. Hard to hear, hard to hear for the disciples, hard to hear now. It's not perhaps what they wanted to hear. We must constantly remind ourselves of the context of the Jewish nation, a nation under occupation, a nation um, maligned over centuries by neighbouring more powerful nations and forces. And the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, was the one to set them free, to liberate, to expel the invaders and bring the Jewish nation back together. And this topsy-turvy inside out, first shall be last, leaders shall be slaves, doesn't quite sound like what they were expecting. And it's a challenge. And it was a challenge and it remained a challenge for the crowd and the disciples all the way to Jerusalem. And it's a challenge for us because what we know, what we know about um, Jesus and the gospel is head knowledge so often, friends, isn't it? We've heard it before. We've heard it many times before. We know that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. But yet so often as individuals and corporately as a church, our kind of instincts, our human instincts drive us in another direction. Since lockdown, we've had the opportunity to reassess how we use our building and we've been able to um, offer hospitality to a number of community groups as well as starting groups of our own. And it's very easy for us to say, oh, well, it should be us first. We should have priority. We shouldn't actually allow anybody from the outside into our building, or we should be very, very careful about doing it because we need it for ourselves. And there's a wisdom and a truth in that in so much as um, it's an opportunity, our building is an asset and we need to use it. But yet we need to consider how much we need to let others go first in using the things that we can offer to the community. We must serve the community, we're planted into the community. It's not about us first, it's about service and being there for others. We've recently put some recycling bins out in our bin store and partnered with the Tendering Primary Recycling Scheme. And this week we were able to empty three wheelie bins for the first time full of recycling, three wheelie bins that aren't going to go into landfill. And that was very, very successful. But unfortunately, not everything that was put in there was as clean and as neat and tidy as we would like. And therefore, those of us who were emptying the bins found ourselves kind of smelly and just in a little bit of an uncomfortable position, diving into bins and pulling out um, things that have been disposed of in a less than ideal way. And it's an act of service. It's a very kind of um, specific way to serve, but it's not an opportunity to complain. Yes, we hope that all who use um, the recycling bins um, putting things that are in the scheme and are clean and are in bread bin, uh, bread bags so that they can be easily separated. All of those good things. But it's an act of service. When we meet on a Sunday, 
how much am I expecting to come and be fed? How much am I expecting that it's about me and I get what I need? And how much freedom do we allow in the construction of the service and in the ethos of how we gather? How much space do I give to the other? How much is it not about my needs being met, but about the needs of others being met? It's a topsy-turvy, inside-out, back-to-front kingdom where leaders are servants and the first are slaves. This has been a sticking point, a point of challenge for the church over to millennia and there have been mistakes, there are mistakes, mistakes will continue to be made because it is a challenge to our kind of essential humanity where our genes kind of drive us to think about survival, to think about ourselves first. That's how um, animals survive. They don't act selflessly. Generally, the selfish gene drives us forward. And it's good to ask questions. And James and John asked some good questions. They asked things of Jesus. And we can do the same. We mustn't be timid when we come before God. We can ask. We can seek him in prayer. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be opened unto us. We can seek God in honest and open relationship as we live our lives, as we meet with him in worship, as we seek him in prayer. And we can be encouraged that J and J, James and John, these sons of thunder, went on to be faithful disciples. They didn't go off in a huff. They weren't rebuffed by Jesus and slunk away in, into a corner you know, how dare you be so cheeky as to demand the places on the left and on the right? They went away and continued their journey with Jesus. They loved and they served God's topsy-turvy, inside-out, back-to-front kingdom. My prayer, friends, is that we can do the same. That the topsy-turvy, inside-out, back-to-front kingdom the now and not yet kingdom is the kingdom that we seek, the kingdom that we seek to share with others, the kingdom that we know as a reality. Today, tomorrow and this week, let us love God from the inside out. stumble again I'm caught in your grace everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame in my heart in my soul I give you control consume Justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. You will above all else, my purpose remains the art of losing myself.
stumble again I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all things In my heart, in my soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Thank you once again to everybody who contributed to our service this week and a huge thanks to you for joining us. Our time together in this way is coming to an end. Let's pray a prayer of blessing as we go. Loving God, may we go now in the power of the Spirit, not to serve ourselves but to serve others, not to seek glory for ourselves but to seek the glory of God the Father so that may all that we are and all that we do make him known through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hope to see you all again very soon, but for today, as ever, that is goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>